We're going to commence our worship this morning by singing to God's praise the hymn 342, the hymn 342, and for those using the hymn book, that's page 315. The King of love my shepherd is, whose goodness faileth never. I nothing lack if I am his, and he is mine forever. The hymn 342. unite our hearts in prayer. Let us pray. Our eternal God and gracious Heavenly Father, we come before Thy throne of grace in the precious, peerless name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, in the name of the One who said of Himself, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. We come pleading all of the infinite merit of His atoning blood and His perfect righteousness, and we rejoice that we have the privilege even now of waiting upon Thee and drawing nigh unto Thee in prayer, yea, calling upon Thy name and seeking Thy face. And, O God, our cry to Thee is that as we draw nigh, that Thou wilt draw nigh unto us that we will have this day in our midst a very conscious sense of Thy nearness and of Thy presence, for we know that Thy presence is the heaven of Thy people. And, O, oh, we rejoice that as Thy people Thou art indeed the object of our love, the very source of all our gladness and all our joy, the very center of our heart's desires, Yea, we can say the very life of our souls. And yet, Lord, we confess before Thee there are those times when we do not sense Thy presence the way that we ought to and the way that we should. 
And O, oh, we cry out with the psalmist, O, oh, when wilt thou come unto me? And O oh, God, we ask that thou wilt draw very near now as we wait upon thee. We ask that thou wilt come nigh to us and minister unto our heart's needs, as thou seest the need in these hearts of ours. For thou dost not look upon us as man looketh, thou dost look right into our hearts, and thou dost see us and know us as we really are. O God, we come with thanksgiving. We come with praise to Thee for Thy mercies, for Thy blessings, for Thy goodness in the week that is gone. We thank Thee that Thou hast brought us safely to the beginning of another week, and to meet here in Thy house on this Thy day. And we cry unto Thee that Thou wilt come again and speak to our hearts through Thy Word. We thank Thee for the Word of God, this that is the God-breathed Word, the inspired Word, the inerrant Word. And it is to that precious Word that we will turn this day to read and then to proclaim it. And, O God, we seek that infilling of the Spirit so that the Word will be preached in the very power of God to the blessing of the hearts of all of Thine own people. And, O, oh, to the saving of those who would hear the Word, but as yet they're not saved, they're not in Christ. It is not well with their souls, for they are still in their sins and on the broad road to destruction. Oh, we beseech thee that today that effectual call in the gospel would go forth to them, that they, they would respond by calling upon thy name for salvation and having an assurance in their hearts that now they're in Christ and it is well we pray for thy blessing to be upon us. We think of our sister congregations across the land today. We pray for all of thy servants as they minister forth the word. We ask that thou wilt be with them, each one, that thou wilt help them, that thou wilt strengthen them, and that thou wilt be pleased to use them in thy service and for the extending of thy kingdom. We pray, too, for our missionaries. We thank thee for those that have gone forth to serve thee in other lands, and we ask, O God, that Thou wilt draw nigh to them, that Thou wilt meet with them day by day and bless all of their work, bless all of their labors in the gospel. And grant, O God, as they sow the good seed, that there will be many that will come to simple but saving faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. O God, we spread the need of our land before Thee once more, this land that has departed so far from Thee, there are so many today that walk in the ways of ungodliness and unrighteousness and wickedness. And, O oh God, we turn away from man, for the arm of the flesh would fail us. We dare not trust our own, but we look to Thee, and we cry unto Thee that Thou wouldst have mercy, O oh, that it might please Thee to come again with that breath from on high, that the wind of the Spirit would blow mightily upon this place that, O oh God, we would see again a great turning from the ways of ungodliness into the ways of truth and righteousness. O oh, come, we pray. Lord, help us as Thy people to be faithful to Thee in a day of increasing apostasy and declension. We ask for that grace to be those who will burn brightly for our Lord and Savior and witness a good confession of the faith. We pray for thy blessing to be upon the work and the witness of this congregation here. We thank thee for it. We remember thy servant. We pray for him, and we ask that thy blessing will rest mightily upon him, and grant that as the word goes forth week by week from this pulpit, that there will indeed be many brought into the kingdom of God. So, Lord, we come and spread this need before thee, beseeching thee that as we continue in worship today, that Thou will come upon us in Thy power and with Thy blessing. For we ask it all in Jesus' name and for our Savior's sake. Amen. We'll sing further to God's praise, the hymn number 39. For those using the hymn book, that's page 191. The hymn number 39, God moves in a mysterious way, His wonders to perform. He plants His footsteps in the sea and rides upon the storm.
Our scripture reading is found in the Old Testament scriptures in the book of 1 Samuel, 1 Samuel and the 23rd chapter. 1 Samuel chapter 23, and commencing our reading at verse 1. Let us hear the word of the Lord. Then they told David, saying, Behold, the Philistines fight against Kilah, and they rob the threshing floors. Therefore David inquired of the Lord, saying, Shall I go and smite these Philistines? And the Lord said unto David, Go and smite the Philistines, and save Kilah. And David's men said unto him, Behold, we be afraid here in Judah. How much more then if we come to Kilah against the armies of the Philistines? Then David inquired of the Lord yet again. And the Lord answered him and said, Arise, go down to Kilah, for I will deliver the Philistines into thine hand. So David and his men went to Kilah and fought with the Philistines and brought away their cattle and smote them with a great slaughter. So David saved the inhabitants of Kilah. And it came to pass when Abiathar the son of Ahimelech fled to David to Kilah, that he came down with an ephod in his hand. And it was told Saul that David was come to Kilah. And Saul said, God hath delivered him into mine hand, for he is shut in by entering into a town that hath gates and bars. And Saul called all the people together to war, to go down to Kilah, to besiege David and his men. And David knew that Saul secretly practiced mischief against him. And he said to Abiathar the priest, Bring hither the ephod. Then said David, O Lord God of Israel, thy servant hath certainly heard that Saul seeketh to come to Kilah to destroy the city for my sake. Will the men of Kilah deliver me up into his hand? Will Saul come down as thy servant hath heard? O Lord God of Israel, I beseech thee, tell thy servant. And the Lord said, He will come down. Then said David, Will the men of Kilah deliver me and my men into the hand of Saul? And the Lord said, They will deliver thee up. Then David and his men, which were about six hundred, arose and departed out of Kilah, and went whithersoever they could go. And it was told Saul that David was escaped from Kilah, and he forbear to go forth. And David abode in the wilderness in strongholds, and remained in a mountain in the wilderness of Ziph. And Saul sought him every day, but God delivered him not into his hand. And David saw that Saul was come out to seek his life, and David was in the wilderness of Ziph in a wood. And Jonathan Saul's son arose and went to David into the wood, and strengthened his hand in God. And he said unto him, Fear not, for the hand of Saul my father shall not find thee, and thou shalt be king over Israel, and I shall be next unto thee, and that also Saul my father knoweth. And they too made a covenant before the Lord, and David abode in the wood, and Jonathan went to his house. Ending our reading there at verse 18, and knowing that the Lord will add his own blessing to the reading of his word for Christ's sake. Amen. Just at this point in the service, I would ask Mr. Hill to come and make the announcements to you. We welcome everyone to our morning service, and if you're visiting with us, you're especially welcome. We also give a very special welcome to our preacher this morning, the Reverend Leslie Curran, the director of Let the Bible Speak. Tonight at 6 p.m., the prayer meeting in the church hall, 6.30 p.m., the evening gospel service, the Reverend Curran will again be the preacher. Wednesday at 8 p.m., the midweek meeting 
The preacher will be Mr. Everett Smith. Next Lord's Day, the 21st of August, 11.30 a.m. morning service, 6 p.m. prayer meeting in the church hall, 6.30 p.m. the evening service. Preacher of both services will be the Reverend Derek Irvin, one of our retired ministers. Last Sabbath evening, we had the sending forth service for our sister Joy. The amount donated so far to help with our work comes to £1,244.50. We thank everyone for their generosity. These are all the announcements. Thank you. May I just take a moment to thank our brother for the kind words of welcome. It's a privilege to be here and to renew fellowship once again with you in the gospel of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We're going to sing another hymn. It's in the hymn book 534 on page 391. Oh, for a faith that will not shrink, though pressed by many a foe, that will not tremble on the brink of poverty or woe. The hymn 534. again seek the Lord in prayer before we turn to the preaching of his word. Let us pray. Our gracious God and Father in heaven, again we bow before thee in our Savior's name, and we thank thee for thy presence already in this meeting. We thank thee for help given to us as we have sought thee in prayer already, as we have read thy word and as we've been singing thy praise. And Lord, as we turn now to gather around thine own word, I cry to thee for help from the sanctuary. I seek again that infilling of the Spirit, for the heart's desire of the preacher is that the word of the Lord will go forth in the power and demonstration of the Spirit himself. Lord, thou dost see the need in each of our hearts, and we ask that Thou wilt speak a word in season to each one of us. May we be able to leave the house of the Lord today and say that we have heard from Thee. A message has come from the Lord through the Word to our very souls today. Lord, keep the meeting under the blood. We thank Thee for the precious blood. What else can we plead but the atoning blood, the blood of infinite merit and value? that blood that the Savior shed. And I ask for blood-bought liberty in the preaching forth of thy word. Shelter our meeting underneath the covering of that blood. And oh, may the Spirit himself take the word. 
and bless it to every heart in the gathering and to all who are listening to the Word today. We ask these things in Jesus' name and for His sake. Amen. After David's victory over Goliath, we find that Saul brought him into his court, and for a period of time we discover that Saul looked very, very favorably upon David. There was much by way of goodwill that he expressed and manifested towards him. But then that was to change, and to change in a most dramatic fashion, in a very, very great way. In fact, it's true to say that the eye of Saul then began to burn with envy and burn with tremendous jealousy against David. And he viewed David as a threat to himself, as a threat to his own position. Such was the situation that developed that we find that David had to flee, and he became a fugitive. And Saul was out to track him down and to end his life if he could. We have been reading here in this 23rd chapter of 1 Samuel of David's plight, of David's situation, of the circumstances that he found himself to be in which were most adverse, and yet he had to face reality of what was happening and where he was and what he should do in the prevailing situation that had developed. For example, we read at the end of verse 14 of this 23rd chapter of 1 Samuel, and Saul sought him, that is, sought David, every day, every day. So he was on the lookout almost uh, 24 hours a day, lest Saul would come and capture him. So it wasn't a good situation to be facing. You might say, well, I could uh, perhaps do my best to evade capture for a little while, for a day or two, or maybe for a week or two, but if this is someone setting out every day to try and track you down and then take your life, there has to be tremendous stress and strain come upon you. And no doubt David himself was experiencing all of that. Here he is in the wilderness, according to verse 15. He's in a, he's in a wood, and yet it is just at this particular time that a friend, a friend of David's, comes to meet with him. And that friend is none other than the son of Saul, Jonathan by name. Jonathan finds out where he is, and he comes to not just uh, bring a, a greeting, he, he comes with a very specific purpose in mind. And with that specific purpose in mind, he comes with a word, a specific word, no doubt a specific word from the Lord to David in the situation that he has found himself. So we read in verse 16 of this 23rd chapter, And Jonathan, Saul's son, arose and went to David into the wood. And then we read these words, And strengthened his hand. Strengthened his hand. It's those words that I want to use as the basis for what I'm going to preach upon and say to you this morning. Here he comes, and we're told that he comes to David, and he comes with this purpose, to strengthen his hand. In fact, what we're looking at here is a friend coming with a word of encouragement in the midst of a very fiery trial. And could it be that there is someone here listening to this word today, and you are in the midst of a very fiery trial? You are in the midst of a terrible time of great opposition or persecution or affliction of one kind or another, and you're here to listen to what the Lord would say to you, and the Lord has a word for you. Just as He had a word for David here, brought by Saul's son, Jonathan. He has come to encourage him in this time of trial. And so as we think upon this, this is going to be the theme based upon those words coming to strengthen his hand. 
this encouragement that he brings. Let's then, first of all, consider with you briefly this encouragement examined. This encouragement examined. It's here in these words, strengthened his hand. It's really a figure of speech. It's not saying that uh, when Jonathan came to bring this encouragement to strengthen David's hand, that he somehow was going to impart physical strength to his hands. Not at all. It's not in that literal sense. It's in a figurative sense that he comes to strengthen his hand. He comes to bring encouragement. Now, the phrase, strengthening the hand, we find in Scripture that it's used really in, in a twofold way, in a twofold sense. We discover there are examples in Scripture, and I'll turn you to them in just a moment, where it is the strengthening of the hand for an evil purpose, a sinful purpose, a strengthening in the ways of ungodliness and wickedness and unrighteousness. For example, we have it over there in the, in the book of Judges, in Judges chapter, chapter 9, where we read of Abimelech, and you may recall that he contrived to make himself a kind of a king uh, during the period of the judges, and he persuaded the people of Shechem that he would be better than any of the sons of his father. And so his Shechemite friends, then they helped him to have all of the sons slain. But God was going to intervene in a wonderful way. But the point I want you to see is what we read there in uh, verse 24 of this ninth chapter, that the men of Shechem, which aided him in the killing of his brethren, there is the marginal reading and translation, which is very enlightening, they strengthened his hands to kill. So there we have this figure of speech being used in a sense that is not a good sense as far as the purpose was concerned. Or we could see another example of this when we, we turn, for example, to the prophecy of, of Jeremiah, Jeremiah chapter 23. And let me just read just a few verses in this 23rd chapter, because here is the prophet Jeremiah, and it's recorded in verse 9 of this 23rd chapter that he says, "'My heart within me is broken.'" We often think of Jeremiah as the weeping prophet. And here he himself is saying, I have got a broken heart. My heart is broken. And then he gives the reason. Because of the prophets. Because of the prophets. What was he speaking of? Who was he speaking of? Who were these prophets? Well, they certainly weren't the prophets of the Lord. They weren't the true prophets. Rather, they were, they were false prophets. And what do false prophets do? Well, we're told here in verse 16 of this same chapter, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, Hearken not unto the words of the prophets that prophesy unto you. They make you vain. They speak a vision of their own heart, and not out of the mouth of the Lord. So that's why the heart of the true prophet Jeremiah was broken because of these false prophets who were going forth preaching a, a false message. They weren't proclaiming the word of the Lord at all. And yet, notice what we read in verse 14 again of this same chapter. I have seen also in the prophets of Jerusalem an horrible thing. They commit adultery. They walk in lies. And then listen to these words. They strengthen also the hands of evildoers. They strengthen also the hands of evildoers. And how were they doing that? They were doing that with the false message that they were proclaiming. So it can be used in that sense for an evil purpose, but then we find it's also used in Scripture to speak of a good purpose, a God-honoring purpose being fulfilled. And we do have examples of that. For example, in the, in the book of Nehemiah, we read there in Nehemiah, Nehemiah chapter 2, 
Let me read just from verse 17. Then said I unto them, Ye see the distress that we are in, how Jerusalem lieth waste, and the gates thereof are burned with fire. Come and let us build up the wall of Jerusalem, that we be no more a reproach. Here is Nehemiah coming, and he's seeking to bring this word of exhortation to them so that they would have something of a resolve of heart and a determination to rise up and do that which was right. In other words, to, to build the wall that had been broken down. And we read on here in this second chapter of Nehemiah, in verse 18, Then I told them of the hand of my God, which was good upon me, as also the king's words that he had spoken unto me. And they said, Let us rise up and build. So they strengthened their hands for this good work. The strengthening of the hands for a good work, not for an evil work. And here, back in 1 Samuel 23, we have Jonathan coming to David to strengthen his hand, to strengthen his hand in a good cause, to strengthen his hand in a, in a righteous cause, to have David with a heart resolved to still do the will of God, to still keep on serving the Lord, to still maintain fidelity, faithfulness to the God of heaven. So he comes with this message, with this purpose, to strengthen his hands so that David will be strengthened. But you'll notice it says also here in verse 16 of 1 Samuel 23, and strengthened his hand in God. Those words are vital. Strengthened his hand in God. He could have come, as we shall see, as the message proceeds, to, to speak to David and, and tell him many, many things. No doubt he could. Of some of the things that his father had been saying, some of the things that his father had been doing in connection with David. But he's coming to strengthen his hand. Yes. But he's coming to strengthen his hand in God. Because when we're going through times of trial, times of great difficulty, when we feel that we have descended into a very dark valley, then sometimes we could begin to question the Lord's goodness. Maybe perhaps in our hearts pose the question, has the Lord forgotten about me? Has the Lord, as the psalmist once said, forgotten to be gracious, forgotten to be merciful? Maybe our experience might be a little bit like Job's, of whom we read in Job 23, verse 8, Behold, I go forward, but he's not there. That is, I don't have a conscious sense of his presence. And backward, but I cannot perceive him. On the left hand where he doth work, but I, I cannot behold him. He hideth himself on the right hand, that I cannot see him. But then Job went on to say, in verse 10, But he knoweth, he knoweth the way that I take. And when he hath tried me, I shall come forth as gold. And then further down that same chapter in verse 14, for he performeth, or the word that's translated performeth really means completeth. For he completeth the thing that is appointed or prescribed for me. And so here is Jonathan coming to David in his situation difficult, and he's coming to strengthen his hand in God so that David will still keep his heart's focus not upon the situation and the circumstances all around him, but he will have his heart's focus in the midst of all of this on the Lord himself so that he will remain faithful unto his God. So that's something of this encouragement examined. But then that brings me in the second place to, to speak to you about this, this encouragement explained. 
You might say, preacher, I hear what you say, that he has come to encourage him, to, to strengthen his hand and to strengthen his hand in God, but how did he do that? How did he do that? Well, we're not left to imagine or speculate. We have it right before us here in, in the context of this verse 16, where there are the words, he strengthened his hand in God. And that's why we find that David here, he's really being brought a message that he has to wait still upon the Lord. But he has to still wait upon the Lord's, the Lord's time. That's important. And he still has to submit to the Lord's way, the Lord's time and the Lord's way to bring David eventually to the place that God has appointed for him. And that's exactly what Jonathan has come to do by bringing this encouragement. And how does he do it? Well, you'll notice several things. He, he reminds him of something. He reminds him of something. And even as God's people, we do need to be reminded so often of things that we know. Oh yes, we know them, but somehow they may have slipped our memory to some degree. And therefore, we need to be reminded lest, we, lest we've forgotten about them. And here is a situation where we find that Jonathan comes with this purpose to strengthen David's hand in God, to bring this encouragement to him in the midst of difficult circumstances, and he's going to remind him of God's promise. He's going to remind him of God's promise. And what was God's promise? Well, he expresses it there in verse 17 of 1 Samuel 23, that thou shalt be king over Israel. It doesn't look it at the moment, David, but God has promised it. This is the promise of God, thou, thou shalt be king. Now, all that David was facing, knowing that Saul was out to get him, to capture him, to end his life every day, he did need to be reminded of God's promise. And here is, here is someone coming, the messenger, the messenger with the message, the message from God, so that David in the midst of his dire situation is going to have his hands strengthened by being reminded of God's promise, lest he would have forgotten it. And in the midst of fiery trials that face us as the children of God, and who amongst us can say that we don't face trial and difficulty? In the midst of those, we do, we do need to cast our minds to the, the promises of the Lord. Yes, if David were just to survey the situation from a human viewpoint and look around him with physical eyes, he would probably have concluded, well, this situation for me is really hopeless. There really is no hope. But yet here is someone coming with this, with this message, reminding him of what the Lord has done, the Lord has said, the Lord has promised that thou shalt be king. God has said it, David. And because God has said it, my father can't stop it. Can't stop it. That's exactly what he's saying here. Can't you see the encouragement that that was going to be to him? He was going to have his heart mightily encouraged. And not only was he really saying, look, my father Saul he will not be able to stop it, but all the powers of darkness and all the powers of hell will not be able to frustrate it. That had to be a tremendous encouragement to David in this, in this situation. So here he is, bringing this word of encouragement by reminding him of the promise of God. But then he has something else to say as well. Not only has he come to remind him of the promise of God by way of encouraging him and hence strengthening his hand in God, 
he wants also to have David recognize something. And what's that? Recognize God's purpose. Recognize, David, God's purpose. That all that is taking place here, all that is happening to you, David, God, God is working out a purpose. And it's his purpose. It's his purpose. It's the purpose of God as there is the outworking of God's providence. And that's exactly what was happening here as far as David was concerned. Here he is in the wilderness. He's in the wood being hunted by Saul every day. And yet God is fulfilling his purpose in his way. So therefore, when he comes here, he does, he does say in verse 17, the hand of Saul, my father, shall not find thee. Because God is working out his own purpose according to the ways of his providence in your life, David, and in the circumstances and in the situation that you find yourself in. You see, the Lord knows all contingencies, doesn't he? We may think that we know one or two contingencies. Oh, well, I think that this might happen, or, oh, I, 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 you know, I, I'm nearly sure that might happen. But then there are so many other things that we have no idea that will happen. But that's not so with God. The Lord knows all the contingencies that we are going to meet with, that we are going to have to face as we travel down the pathway of life here on this earth as the people of God before we get home to glory. And knowing all contingencies then, cannot we be encouraged that nothing will take him by surprise? There's so much that takes you and me by surprise. Oh, you know, I never thought that. I never thought I would face this, or I never thought I would whatever it might be. And we're, we're shocked almost by it. We're surprised by it. But nothing takes the Lord by surprise, knowing all of the contingencies. So when he comes, that is, when Jonathan comes here to David, he's coming to strengthen his hand not, not by considering, well, what is the probability that my father will not find you? No, he's saying, he won't find you. There's absolute certainty here. And he's wanting David to recognize God's purpose in all of this. And therefore, having been reminded of the promise and now being told to recognize the purpose, can't you see what he's doing in speaking like this to David? To strengthen his hand by deriving from the promise fresh confidence. Fresh confidence in what? Fresh confidence in the invincibility of God's purpose. So you've got an immutable promise because God's promises don't change. They don't. They're immutable. They're unchangeable. So when you have got an immutable promise and an invincible purpose, can't you see that the heart of David would be greatly encouraged? There is the strengthening of his hand in God. The strengthening of his hand in God. But there's something else that Jonathan does here. And we read of it in the very next verse, verse 18 of this 23rd chapter. And they too made a covenant. 
Obviously, the two here is a reference to Jonathan and David as he has met with them here in the wood, the wood of Ziph. And they too made a covenant before the Lord. Now think of those words for a moment or two. Here they are, two friends. One of them has come to meet David, to encourage him, to tell him to still wait on the Lord, plead the promises of God, God's working out his purpose in his own way. But we find there's a further encouragement here in that there is a covenant that is made, a covenant. Or if we wanted another word for the word covenant here, we could think of the word pledge. And so we, we might read it just to get the sense. And they too made a pledge, a pledge before the Lord. Now this is interesting. It's, uh, I feel it's very enlightening. It's very, very instructive. Remember, it's, it's Saul's son, Jonathan, who has come. Jonathan might expect to be the heir. And yet here he's coming to David and he's saying to David, thou shalt be king. Thou shalt be king over Israel. There's no jealousy. There's no rivalry. There's no envy. But they make this covenant or this pledge. And it's a serious thing. Serious in the sense that we're told there in verse 18, and they too made a covenant before the Lord. They're very conscious they're doing this in the presence of God. And that adds a note of solemnity, a note of seriousness to what they're engaging in here as they made this covenant or this pledge. Well, Perhaps you would ask the question, and rightly so, well, you say they made the covenant or the pledge. What kind of a covenant? What kind of a pledge? We could best describe it as a covenant or a pledge of friendship. A covenant or a pledge of friendship. And that really is what it was. It was a pledge of friendship. But I want you to notice that this is the third occasion when they make this pledge. This pledge has been made before. They have entered into this covenant before, and if you like, here on this occasion, they're renewing or they're they're reaffirming the pledge or the covenant. And when you go back in the earlier chapters of 1 Samuel, you discover, let me just read the opening verses of chapter 18 of 1 Samuel for a moment, just, just to get the context. And it came to pass when he had made an end of speaking unto Saul that the soul of Jonathan was knit with the soul of David, and Jonathan loved him as his own soul. And Saul took him that day and would let him go no more home to his father's house. That's what we said earlier in the introduction. Then Jonathan and David made a covenant because he loved him as his own soul. Now you might say, well, that was, that was a fairly easy thing to do. In, in one sense, yes, because at that point, Saul was showing great favor and goodwill towards David. So you might say, well, it wasn't too difficult then for Jonathan to make a covenant with David because he loved him as his own soul. They were just good friends, a covenant of friendship, a pledge of friendship, and it would meet no doubt with the approval of Jonathan's father, Saul. So, 
as we go over further and we come to 1 Samuel chapter, chapter 20. 1 Samuel chapter 20 and verses 16 and 17, we read there, So Jonathan made a covenant with the house of David. So this is the second time when this pledge or this covenant is made. What's the difference this time? The difference is that the friendship between Jonathan and David is now under great strain as far as Saul, Jonathan's father, would be concerned. Great strain. And so still, Jonathan was willing to pay the price of being something of an outcast in the eyes of Saul in order to make this pledge or this covenant of friendship with David because it certainly didn't have the smile and the approval of Saul now. But still Jonathan and David pledge their friendship. They make the covenant of friendship. And then that brings us to 1 Samuel 23 that we've been focusing our attention upon. And verse 18, And they too made a covenant before the Lord. This is the third time. This is the third time that the covenant is reaffirmed or renewed. Then I want, in closing, having thought about the encouragement ex examined and the encouragement explained, just to speak to you briefly about the encouragement experienced. The encouragement experienced. And David here unquestionably experienced, experienced this encouragement. In fact, we find that as Jonathan brings this message, it begins in the verse 17 with the words, Fear not. Fear not. And so here is an encouragement that is going to be experienced by David. And I must ask you and challenge your heart, can you say that you are experiencing this encouragement in the sense of knowing your hand being strengthened in God as you think of his promises and of his purpose, and maybe going maybe to some, some dear friend facing many trials and difficulties, and you're, you're going with a word pledging still that friendship and that, that covenant so that they might, they might experience encouragement. Think of the promises that would have us experience this very encouragement. When thou passest through the waters, I will be with thee. And through the rivers, they shall not overflow thee. Have you been going through those rivers that you feel are overflowing you? When thou walkest through the fire, thou shalt not be burned, neither shall the flame kindle upon thee. What about the promise that the Lord gives to his people? I will, I will never leave thee, nor forsake thee. Are you experiencing that encouragement from that promise? This is the Lord speaking to you as one of his children and saying to you, I will, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. And remember all of these promises. I, I think of the thoughts that the Lord has towards his people. And it's almost as if he has put his thoughts in the language that we can understand and given us his promises. It's almost as if God has put his thoughts into those promises for your encouragement. The promises that are exceeding great and precious, 
the promises that can never fade, the promises that can never, never ever fail. Are you experiencing that encouragement to think that God is working out His, His purpose? You remember the promise, I will build my church? That's God's promise. I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Oh, to be reminded of God working out His invincible purpose. And when we experience such encouragement, then we're able, we're able to say with Paul, aren't we, in Romans 8, 28, we know. We know that all things work together for good. And how is that? Because there is one who is working the all things together for your good and for mine. So, Jonathan has come here, and we might think of it like this, to just put David's hand in the hand of God just to put his hand in the hand of God by reminding him of the, the promises and have him recognize the purpose and then to make the pledge again, renewing it, reaffirming it of, of friendship. I think of what the Apostle Paul said whenever he was writing to the Corinthian believers in his second, his second letter, 2 Corinthians 1. We find he's Speaking words here, let me read them to you, verse 8. For we would not, brethren, have you ignorant of our trouble, which came to us in Asia. What kind of trouble? Well, he describes it. Listen to it. We were pressed out of measure, above strength, insomuch that we despaired even of life. But we had the sentence of death in ourselves that we should not trust in ourselves, but in God, which raiseth the dead, who delivered us from so great a death, and doth deliver, in whom we trust that He will yet deliver us. You see what Paul is speaking of here? He's speaking of things that had happened in the past. Oh, we were pressed out of measure above strength. We despaired even of life. But he's saying we still trusted the Lord, and we're going to continue to trust Him, that He will yet deliver us. Because what He has said He will do, He will perform. And Paul obviously experienced encouragement. And that's what the Lord wants us as His people to do, to experience His encouragement. And what greater encouragement could we have, do we have, than His own precious Word, which is truth, absolute truth. Our hearts then should be greatly encouraged. So Jonathan brings this message to encourage him to strengthen his hand in God so that David would continue still to press on with God. And maybe as I close, I speak to some dear child of God here, and you're finding the going hard, almost to the point of saying, well, I don't know if I can really press on any further. Maybe David, in one sense, felt like that. But there came a word in season, just right there at the very time he needed it most. And the Lord brings a word to your heart today, just the right word at the right time when you need it most. But maybe you're listening to the message and you don't know the Lord. You're trying to go through life yourself in your own strength with your own plans, according to your own wisdom, and you're not saved. 
I exhort you to come to Christ, to get into Christ, to be joined to Him. And how do you do that? By coming and believing on Him, by coming and trusting in Him. And then you'll be in the family of God, and God will be your heavenly Father, and you will have all of the promises that He has given to His own. And you'll be one of His own because you're in Christ, saved by grace, through faith, with an everlasting salvation. Come to Christ and trust Him today. Let's bow in prayer. Our gracious God and Father in heaven, we do again thank Thee for Thy presence, and we thank Thee for Thy Word. We rejoice that Thy Word gives us those exceeding great and precious promises, and we pray that we may take those promises and find them, experience them, being an encouragement to our hearts. The devil is out to discourage us. The devil is out to have us despond and despair. But we thank Thee that Thou dost give us Thine own Word to encourage us to press on and to press through with God. Bless Thy Word to the hearts of all of Thy people today, and even to the hearts of any who have listened, but they're not yet saved, they're out of Christ. We pray that this might be a saving Word to their soul. And oh, that for thine own dear children, that they will be strengthened in thee and encouraged greatly in the things and in the work of God. We ask that thou wouldst be pleased to separate us now, and may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be the abiding portion of each of God's children now and forevermore. Amen.